Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Trisha Mims, the Executive Director of National Park Partners. And today we are recognizing Black Philanthropy Day, August 28th, is a, a national day to really reflect on the, the history, past, present, uh, and future of Black giving in America and beyond. Uh, and my guest today is James McKissick. Um, James, would you please introduce yourself and your, and your current role for our audience? All right, well, hi everybody. I'm James McKissick and I currently serve as the president of Arts Build and Arts Build is a local arts funder, arts advocate. We run arts leadership programs and also arts education programs in partnership with Hamilton County Schools. Wonderful. Well, um, I wanted to speak to you today. Uh, you became a supporter of National Park Partners in 2019 after you were able to participate in one of our interpretive recreation programs. Uh, we have a series of ranger-led outdoor experiences where we partner with Outdoor Chattanooga to get people out on, to experience the land uh, in a recreational way, but, but also learning a story along the way. And uh, I know the program that you were a part of really inspired you a great deal. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about the program and, and how it uh, kind of inspired you to, to support our broader mission? Well, the program was called Paddling to Freedom, mm -hmm. and um, it was a recreation of the paddling route or the canoe route uh, that Jacob Cummings took. Um, and he was a gentleman who was enslaved in Chattanooga, and um, he decided that he was going to go for his freedom like so many other people. And um, instead of like sneaking and, you know, going out at night or uh, using disguises like, you know, some others might have done, um, he actually stole a canoe, uh, waited one night and then canoed across and up some, up some of the Tennessee River uh, to freedom, hence paddling to freedom. Mm -hmm. And um, when I heard about the, uh, the opportunity to do the tour, uh, I, had always, I had been for years, you know, doing activities with outdoor Chattanooga, paddling, kayaking. Um, I um, helped lead uh, canoe and kayak tours each year when I worked with city government for, for our interns. And um, loved it so much that I actually have bought my own canoe and, and joined um, the Tennessee Valley Canoe Club. <laughs> uh, my, my canoe vehicle got crushed in a recent tornado, so I haven't been able to, to go to many places recently. But um, it was just, it sounded like a fascinating thing. Like it, it was a great way to connect Black history, local history, um, and my passion for outdoors and for uh, being uh, in my canoe and enjoying nature uh, around the story of Jacob Cummings. Okay, wonderful. Well, um, as they probably mentioned during the program, um, that those kind of interpretive programs that our rangers do thoroughly research and, and really try to find new angles and new human interest stories to really mm -hmm. tell the bigger picture because we are a, a, you know, primarily a, a Civil War battlefield park, and of course, Moccasin Bend is also a National Archaeological District with significant indigenous history. But that doesn't um, tell the fuller picture of what the lives were like of the people who lived in this area before, during, and after the war. And so right. I think our, our rangers really do a wonderful job of, of finding those maybe lesser known stories or, or lesser told stories and, and finding a, a way to connect um, people to them. So I'm really glad that you were able to participate in that. And uh, I wanted to uh, sort of ask you how that relates to you, another uh, organization that I know that you're a part of is the Sankofa Fund. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I'm fascinated with, I heard, I heard a presentation uh, through, through the um, Association of Fundraising Professionals here in Chattanooga about the Sankofa Fund. So uh, I learned quite a bit, but I would love for our audience to learn a little bit more about what the Sankofa Fund does and how that relates to Black philanthropy. Well, the Sankofa Fund, and I guess the full name is the Sankofa Fund for Civic Engagement. And um, for the past year, uh, I've been pleased and happy to serve as the president of the organization. Um, following in the steps of our first president, uh, Rebecca Suttles, who you might know from the Community Foundation. 
Um, but we're a giving circle, which means that we um, each member decides to give six hundred to twelve hundred dollars a year. Um, we put it into one pot. And then throughout the year, we uh, make decisions about where to invest the money, who to give it to, what programs and projects in Chattanooga to support. Um, and because we are a black led and black uh, founded giving circle, we give money to black led and black um, supporting organizations in the city. Um, and giving circles have been around forever really i mean <laughs> if you think about the history of black people in our country you know um post enslavement who we had to to make a way for ourselves and you know these types of circles and benevolent societies and and group um group giving and group uh, money uh processes are what allowed us to do things like start schools, um, buy farmland, um, start hospitals, because you know we were not able to go to the hospital with everyone else or go to school with everyone else. Um, so we had to figure out ways to collectively use our resources um, to, to, to provide the things that we needed in our community. So it's a very old model, um, but one that still resonates even today. I mean, every week <laughs> we see more and more about the ongoing struggle for civil rights in our country. And, you know, just like my ancestors might have funded a hospital or a school, um, you know, Sankova Fund has funded uh, bottled water and food and a website for some of the uh, protesters and people who are in the streets. Um, you know, making and demanding equal rights and equal treatment for Black people. And the, the name Sankofa, I learned about that too, and, and the symbol with the, the bird, with the, yeah. the feet kind of going forward. Forward. With the, the head looking back, so remembering yeah. where we came, but always going forward. And I think that's, that's what we're doing, like, just like I said, like, we're moving forward, but we always have to look back to remember and um, you know, use and replicate those models that have worked for us in the past. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, so I know that there's not sort of a one size fits all description of black philanthropy. It, it, it's individual and giving is, is a very individual decision for people. But do you, have you noticed any trends or certain themes that sort of can, tend to come up over and over when you're, when you're thinking about um, your experiences both in the nonprofit world, you know, as a philanthropist yourself, and um, just, you know, kind of having your your finger on the pulse, James. You're 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 involved in a lot of things. So, uh, you know, if, if if there's anyone who maybe is noticing some themes, I, I think uh, I'd love to hear your take on it. Well, that's why I have all these gray hairs right here now, probably <laughs> being involved in too many things. <laughs> Um, but one thing that you will hear a lot in Black philanthropy is that uh, Black people consistently give more of their income to causes and charities than any other race in our country. Um, and I think there are some reasons for that, and there are some trends and, um, and uh, aspects of our culture that kind of feed that. So one of our great... Uh, one of the things that we spend or put a lot of money into in, in our communities is the Black church, which does um, not only uplift our spirit and our soul, but it does also uh, do lots of work in communities, you know, feeding people, housing people, uh, educating people, um, providing a lot of the basic human needs for people in the Black community who may need that. Uh, but a lot of the research also shows that Black philanthropists give to organizations and causes that they have uh, connections to. So you'll see lots of people give to their colleges, like HBCUs will get support. Um, if they're part of a fraternity or sorority that does lots of work in the community, they will give to that as a way to, um, to push forward and push through community service and community activism. 
um, one thing that I've been really passionate about is a lot of my philanthropy goes to the arts. Um, and I do commit, I always commit each year to give 10% of my, my personal income to uh, organizations and specifically to arts organizations. And um, my goal at Arts Build has been to increase the number of Black and other people of color donors who give to our organization. So that's something that for the past six months I've been thinking about, um, <laughs> you know, pushing. And I'm excited because very soon uh, we're going to do a digital donor cultivation event. And um, that's going to be one of our first attempts at trying to grow our foundation of Black and other person, persons of color donors to the organization. Great. Um, yeah, that, I think that's, you know, I'm glad you mentioned this, the service aspects of philanthropy as well, because it's not always just writing a check. There yeah. are ways to give back and, and to serve, um, serve the community. So that's... Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of times in our community, you'll hear people say, you're giving of your time, your talent, and your treasure. And treasure comes last in that phrase, you know? Okay. <laughs> you know you, yeah. So uh, many of us are philanthropists because we give time and volunteer. Um, we give our talents, you know, to raise money, to, to draw attention to causes. I mean, look at just what happened this week with the NBA players. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're talented athletes, but just by taking a stand, I mean, they stopped all of the attention and drew it to the cause of Black Lives Matter. So time, talent, and treasure is, is what we can give and, and the way that we can impact our community. Indeed. Um, so you, you mentioned, uh, and I think this is probably something that I would venture to say most folks don't know, is that the as a percentage of, of their income that, that the black community gives the most. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, so what else uh, is, are maybe some misnomers or misconceptions or things that people just don't know about um, black philanthropy? Is there anything you wanna highlight or that we haven't already covered or do you- Well, I think, I mean, as I close, um, you know, I would probably say, you know, many people don't think of themselves as philanthropists, even though they're giving time, talent, and treasure. And um, one of my favorite stories about philanthropy is uh, a lady named Osceola McCarthy, and she was a washerwoman in Mississippi. And, you know, that's different from now <laughs> when we push a button and a machine washes our clothes. No. <laughs> Like she had a big pot in her yard. <laughs> she had rub boards. She had to scrub and rub, you know, the spots out of clothes. Um, and she did this her entire career and um, had always had a dream that one day she would go to college and was never able to. And one of the most fascinating things is that as she retired, um, she had saved up a, about a, over $100,000 and she gave it to the University of Mississippi as a gift to establish a scholarship so that young people from her community um, would have the opportunity to go to school in a way that she did not. And I mean, that's an example of philanthropy. We wouldn't think that someone of her income level, um, someone who's not, you know, well known, I mean, she was you know, Beyonce makes headlines when she gives money. <laughs> uh, you know what I'm saying? Like Jay-Z does or whoever, yeah. Nas, Kanye. But we don't have to be headline-making people. We don't have to be millionaires and billionaires. In fact, millionaires and billionaires give way less, like you said, as a percentage of their income than, than average people do. So lean into being and accepting yourself as a philanthropist. Know that wherever you are in life, you can give back. And um, you can also build that legacy of philanthropy into your family and your community as well. Great, well, thank you, James. I really appreciate you taking the time to 
to speak with us about this. I Thank think. you. And if you want to get started with philanthropy, you can always donate to the parks or <laughs> even the arts, right? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I mean, they go hand in hand. You they know. do, yeah. The they world and the created uh, environment are, are um, you know, just symbiotic, synergistic. There are two, of. and really there are two of the things that are keeping us sane right now, you know, as we experience this pandemic, the arts, the outdoors. I mean, without those, we probably would have lost it months <laughs> ago. <laughs> I know I would have. Yeah, this... Uh, <laughs> This would have yeah. been a, a, a much um, more bleak. Uh, yes, it would have. Yeah. Without being able to find the, that inspiration. Um, yes, for sure. Well, again, I, I really appreciate you taking the time and thank you for uh, supporting National Park Partners. And, um, and I, you know, love to hear more of your ideas on how we can continue to uh, work with the park to tell these bigger stories of civil war to civil rights and the human interest and the, and the people sort of that, that maybe um, ha have not gotten the spotlight historically, but but their stories are really incredible. Just that story oh, of yeah. David Cummings is just unbelievable. And to think that that happened right, you know, right, right there. Right there, right? Yeah. yeah. It's pretty amazing. So well, I love it. Let's keep doing it then. Thank you. Yeah. Let's, we'll, maybe, we'll, maybe we'll start a series of conversations about uh, different um, topics du jour. <laughs> yeah. But uh, have a great weekend, Jane. You too. Thank you. you all the best. And thanks for the invite. Absolutely.